Hello, Miami University community. Thank you for uh, tuning in for our second installment of our Black History Month webinar. And today we're here to talk about one of an awesome project that we just uh, kind of finished up here and we're talk, talk to folks about it. It's our Lived Experiences Race at Miami University project, um, which was funded by the Boldly Creative Fund from the university. Um, and so we have a fantastic team here. So we have Jackie Johnson, university archivist, uh, Aaliyah LaVar Wegner, uh, digital, digital collections librarian. Um, we also have uh, Andy Rice, uh, assistant professor. Um, and we also have Dr. Yvette Harris, who is a professor in uh, psychology. So we'll go ahead and uh, kick it off with Jackie to kind of talk about the project. Lived Experience at Miami University is a pilot project. It's a collaborative storytelling project that chronicles the history of racial dynamics at Miami University. It tells the stories of African-American Black alumni are, are told through documentaries, oral histories, and archival stories. And the project was funded by the Boldly Creative Initiative, the Humanities Center, and the Greater Oxford Community Foundation. The members of the team, Aaliyah LaVar Wegner, digital, digital collections librarian, Jody Perkins, metadata digital librarian, Andy Rice, professor in journalism, Yvette Harris, a professor in psychology, Denise Brazil, professor in educational leadership, Darrell Callier, professor in educational leadership, Helen Shoemaker, a professor of history, Kate Romanier, a professor in educational leadership, and Steve Kahn, professor in history. The other members are the members of the Alumni Association Humanity Center, Seth Seward, who is the Alumni Relations Assistant Director, and Timothy Melly, who is the Director of the Humanity Center. So as part of this project, we created uh, many different kinds of stories in a single year. Um, from February 2022 to today, we digitized 10, over 10,000 pages of archival material relating to race at Miami as part of this project. We also worked with a team of public historians and history students to create 29 historical biographies of Miami University alumni of color who aren't here to tell their stories. And um, the documentary and oral history team created 25 oral histories. Uh, these are new ones um, that add to our, our other collections, our other oral history collections about uh, Black experience at Miami. And also uh, we created five documentaries as part of this project. And also one website that brings all these different, uh, different things together, different stories together. So I'd like to pass it off uh, to Dr. Andy Rice and Seth Seward to talk a little bit more about the oral histories and the documentaries as part of the project. All right. Andy, you wanna go ahead first? Yeah. Hi, everybody. So I am a filmmaker uh, and I teach in the Department of Media, Journalism and Film uh, and write about documentary work and history. Uh, and Seth and I uh, kind of work together on this documentary project. Uh, it's provided a lot of the material that's currently on the website. And uh, we had three main goals uh, in putting these pieces together. So I want to just very briefly talk through those, and then we'll show you the trailer. And Seth can talk about uh, the trailer part. So uh, the first key goal uh, was to establish uh, an oral history archive uh, through interviews with Black former students, uh, faculty who are working here, staff, uh, that could be used in future research and teaching applications. And so all of these uh, interviews have now uh, been made public on the website that Ali is going to talk to you guys about. Uh, you can go to the next slide here. You see a couple pictures of all these folks. There we go. Uh, so from all eras, we talked to people who were here in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s uh, across all of the different strata that uh, are in the university. Might be some familiar faces here. If you guys are alumni. We've got Rodney Coates in the kind of bottom right corner there. Terrence Moore, bottom left, was the first uh, black reporter at the Miami Student. Um, we have uh, Deborah Scott on the alumni. She's been on the Alumni Relations Board for many years. She's in that still. This is kind of the top right corner, second down. She is showing with her hands how big her hair was in the 1970s there. Uh, and in the center, we have five of the students who graduated in 1970 to 1971. 
uh, reflecting on their experiences of being at Miami in a moment where there was a great deal of protest on campus, including a photograph from the Miami student right behind them there of the Rowan Hall takeover. So we heard all kinds of really interesting stories uh, in talking to these people. Uh, and we wanted those to be accessible uh, to the general public to kind of learn about this history as they, uh, uh, as we move forward in this kind of new phase of what Miami is going to become. You can go to the next slide here, JJ. Uh, part of this project was about asking uh, the folks that we could still talk to about people that had been really important to them. Uh, we made four uh, what we call trailblazers videos about some of these early black staff and faculty that established uh, key programs here, including black world studies, uh, the Black Student Action Association, the Office of Black and Minority Student Affairs uh, that has since become the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion and still serves a lot of our uh, minority populations here on campus. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. You can see the, the four that we made are of uh, Dr. Heenan Wilkins, Marion Musgrave, Larry Young, and Joseph Cox. Uh, they are also available on the website. So these are four short documentaries uh, that, that uh, people can use in classroom settings or public forums like this one uh, to be able to learn about what life was like for these folks and uh, kind of give them, give them their flowers uh, now, even though it's a little bit uh, after they've passed. So we're thinking of this as a template. It's not an exhaustive list, uh, uh, kind of a model moving forward. We could do more short pieces like this. Um, and I think this is, it's been an, this has been a nice part of the project here. We also worked with two students who aren't on the call today. Uh, these are all edited by a senior here in journalism named Maggie Pena. Uh, and she did really terrific work over last summer, uh, piecing these together. You can go to the next slide. And the last thing we did, uh, was cr we created a feature length film. Uh, out of all of the materials that we gathered. Uh, and this is a modular film in some ways. It has different sections. So in teaching settings, you could use just a 10 to 15 minute chunk of it or the entirety of the, of the film. Um, we're proud of the work. It is uh, an hour and 39 minutes long right now and tells a fairly comprehensive story. Doesn't get everything in there. Uh, and this uh, was edited uh, with the help of a student named Annika Elias, who's a senior this year. A uh, very talented young woman who, um, you know, knows knows this archive really well at this point. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Seth. He can talk a little bit about the project and introduce the trailer for us here. So thank you guys, and I look forward to questions. Yes. So we uh, came up the term bittersweet um, for the documentary. It was uh, mentioned by um, Larry Young, who's previously, me previously mentioned here as a Black alum, came back to work for the university, and also Antonio White, um, who worked for two presidential administrations, um, used the term uh, bittersweet to kind of talk about the experience. And so, again, it was a comprehensive uh, view of what experience of a Black student is at a predominantly white institution. And so we kind of try to capture all, all different viewpoints from, ad, from administration, from staff and faculty, um, alumni um, and students from the current view of students to kind of give a, uh, a picture and a view of what's currently going on, but also with the foundation of what took place before. Uh, so we hope folks will uh, take a, a like to listening. Uh, later on, we'll have it on the website for everybody to view uh, afterwards. We had the premiere uh, in person yesterday at Scheidler Hall. And so we just want to play this, this trailer um, that's a few minutes long to give a kind of a hint of what the documentary will be if you happen to tune in. I had a, uh, a culture shock. I felt I like I lived in the twilight zone. Mixed. I don't have a lot of black professors and I'm often like the only black person and in my then class. You find yourself also feeling like you have to educate oh, everyone. It's a sugar cookie of a campus, right? Like not a single chocolate chip in any of these classes. And white um, uh, fellow students like staring at the washing machines because they'd never washed their own clothes before. You have been privileged 
to just be a fish in water, that the water is designed for you. This school is weird. This is not, <laughs> this is not what a regular institution looks like. My experience has been, not even you don't belong or you're not supposed to be here, but like, we don't want you. Like, you're not the aesthetic. I've heard that. Even though like we're just a small percentage at Miami, like it still feels like a huge amount of people because those are the majority, the only people I interact with. At the end of the day, I know I have my community here, so I've had overall a good experience at Miami. Um, coming here as a first gen, I really needed anchors. And so when I got here, I was anxious to find mentors. I found Bill Madison, and that meant a lot to me. In some ways, I feel that I'm, I've been successful. Because of Miami, I was able to do the things that, I, that I've been able to do in my life. I love this place. This was a transformative experience for me being a Miami student. And so I want to contribute that to other students coming up. From me working in the Office of Diversity, that's how everything opened up. I'm very happy that I came here and now I'm a graduate of Miami. I love and honor all day long. But why was my experience at Miami bittersweet, you know? Yeah, so there you got all, all a whole bunch of viewpoints there. So it should be a great film. And so we will uh, update folks as we go on and how to view it and we hope that you'll take a liking to it and provide um some uh feedback or uh that you have of the film once uh, it's available publicly um i'd also like to um kick play a video of uh, one of our members um helen schumacher uh she's a professor in the history department she unfortunately was, wasn't able to be here today but uh she and her team did a lot of documented research on the earliest black workers and international students uh, that's also part of the lived experiences website. So let's go Maker, ahead and, let's and my her. role in I am Helen Shoemaker, and my role in this project as the representative of um, the history department uh, was to identify items that were already in the Miami University archives related to the lives of African American um, students faculty and staff over the long history of Miami. Uh, my process here was to go through boxes, particularly of the presidents beginning in 1900 and moving through uh, Shriver's presidential administration. Also looking at student life and looking at the financial records of the university. At the beginning of the project, we estimated a possible 10,000 pages of items in the archives, I located um, about 10,000 pages in this very first stage of the pilot project. There is more to discover in the archives, but we're super pleased to present what we have already found. Okay, thank you, thank you, JJ, for playing that. Uh, we'll kick it to uh, Aaliyah here, uh, who, who and her team did excellent work in putting together the website uh, for every folk, for everybody to come in and see all the research that was done. So, Leah, can you tell us about the, the website for us? Yes, thank you, Seth, for that introduction. We um, So, as you heard, we have many different types of stories. We have the documentaries, the oral histories. We also have the historical biographies and um, the archival documents themselves, which are uh, tell their own stories. And so we wanted a website that would bring all of this together uh, in an accessible and educational way for, for all sorts of researchers, both uh, folks living in Oxford, as well as uh, professors and students who are interested in this and alumni, of course. And so this is our first attempt at this challenge, Lived MU. Um, I hope you can Go ahead, I'll, we can put it in the chat box too, um, so that you can easily explore it yourself. 
Uh, we worked with a phenomenal web services team here at the library and to create the website in, in, a, that, in a way that centered diversity and equity inclusion too. Uh, we wanted to put people first on this website. And I wanna thank uh, our web services team, Ken Irwin, Ming Q and Jerry Ornetsky for doing such a fabulous job and for Tiffany Dogan in our special collections for kind of being the glue that held um, that project together. And so our website opens with those bold images and these callouts on the side uh, in the image carousel. Uh, and there's just to inspire ways that you can interact with the website. We want you to listen, learn, watch and engage all these different stories. And on that bottom panel there, that's where we have our web pages, um, the different parts of the website. So about, you can learn more about this project, our stories. This is, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but it's kind of the heart of that website, this website archives. We have an archive portal for you. Um, we also have ways that you can kind of start your research or jumpstart your research or your other your other interests. And finally, we want you to be in, get involved in the project. This is, as uh, people have been saying, this is a pilot project, our first year. So there's gonna be, we have to be many more stories to tell and other ways to, to involve people. So um, when we go to our story finder, which is the heart of our website, that would be the next slide, please. There you go. Um, this is where you can explore the different types of stories created for this project. And here you can see we have a, a grid of faces. Some may be familiar. If you, if you know Gerald, you would if you're an alum. Um, we also have some that are, this is where our historical biographies come in. There's many stories to tell from folks who are here in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, so this is where our students have done these incredible historical biographies, deep dives, they're almost like essays, um, to go into more detail about what, what their experiences, like Elizabeth Riley Kelly here was like um, during her time. And we also want you to explore these based on your own interests. So on the, I guess it's, it's my right, uh, we have uh, some different categories that you can explore. For example, you can sort by decade. So if you're interested in the just 20s, 40s and 50s, you can kind of slide that slider so you can just see stories from that time period. Uh, race and ethnicity, we're slowly building out, but you know, we focused on black experience predominantly, but we are, we do have some Asian American experiences um, on the website and we, uh, in other versions, um, iterations, we hope to um, add even more different types of stories there. Um, we have themes, uh, those a little bit further down the page uh, that you can explore based on topics and kind of similar experience and also gender too, because we want to be intersexual. We understand that um, there, there are many different ways to, to explore these stories and see those commonalities, but also ways that they differ too. Next slide, please. When you click on any of those faces, what you'll find is a story page will open up. And this is what, where the biographical information are, is featured. So you can easily get a, at first glance, um, a big picture of where somebody uh, was, what their job or, or major was at the university, their years. Um, we also have on the sides, we have some themes that kind of connect or define their experience, some kind of big topic umbrellas um, and that also connect with other stories as well. If you're interested in learning about mentorship, you can click on that and there'll be um, other stories that are really connected to that theme. And we also have uh, other connected related stories, for example, example here, it connects to a story by Cynthia. And she was an alum uh, who graduated in 1970 who really benefited and um, from Larry's kindness and mentorship. And she talks about that in her oral history um, when she was a student here. So you can kind of see this thread develop. On the next slide, uh, we have you moved down that same page. Um, this is where, you know, you'd have the main content of that story page. If it's a documentary like this page here, um, this is where you can view that documentary. Uh, Andy mentioned these are the Trailblazers uh, uh, by Maggie Pina. She uh, put these together and they're, they're just phenomenal. And so you can uh, understand a little bit about uh, Larry Young's impact here at Miami University. This, these, I, I like these um, short documentaries because they really integrate not you know other oral histories, but archival documents. So you're getting a full picture of someone's someone's impact and experience here. And um, if you scroll down a little bit more, I'm um, sorry. Uh, next slide. I'm kind of envisioning it in my head here. 
we, some story pages uh, have a curated selection of documents as well from our digital collections that give different, different perspectives or more context to people's lived experiences. So here for Larry Young's page, you know, we have a Miami student article uh, in 1974 where Larry talks very frankly about the social isolation that black students experience at Miami and what the university should do to change that. Um, and there are other articles as well that we've included here. And these are just a, a, a small sampling. It's just, especially for Larry Young, we have a lot in our digital collections for him. But just to kind of give that uh, story and that lived experience a bit more context. Um, we hope to do even more story mapping uh, like this over the next few months. So we ideally, we want every page, story page, to have some of these selected documents. And uh, thank you. Uh, and those, I mentioned that, you know, the few documents you just are the tip of the iceberg. Well, I guess this would be the iceberg. This is, uh, these are the curated documents that, um, and these digitized documents that Helen mentioned um, that she selected over the summer, about 10,000 pages. And we have a, we created a portal for you on that website so that you have a really easy search terms to search our race at Miami University Digital Collection, which brings that together and lets you explore that broader history of university policies and practices that shape the lived experience of black students, faculty, and staff here at Miami University. But in the process of doing that, you also see how um, students and faculty push back against, the, against that and like made it impact themselves and themselves help change some of those policies to make this a more just place. So, and making this history more visible, it meant that we had to digitize all this material. And so we've been uploading, uploading new batches weekly. And so by the end of the month, we hope to have the most comprehensive digital collection on race at a predominantly white institution. And uh, right now, our, our repository content DM picked a terrible time to do some Im uh, image server maintenance. So it's not fully functional at the moment, but I encourage you to bookmark that link because in the next few days we'll be, uh, they'll have switched over our image server and we'll have even um, better ways to explore that material. But um, I do wanna give you a little bit of, uh, Dr. Shoemaker gave you a little bit of background um, onto kind of her approach to that storytelling and her historical research. And I'd like to show you a few documents that kind of, um, that she discovered as part of that kind of investigation selection process. So, you know, one of the big things that we were doing over the summer is looking at our archives and trying to ask new questions. So we were going through material that hadn't been gone through in a long time, and we're trying to connect it to the lived experiences and the documentaries um, and the oral histories that are, that are also part of this project. Um, and one of the things was having that, that archival thread that kind of pulls through them, and you'll see that too. Uh, come out in the documentaries and also Bittersweet does a great job of that, bringing that together. But one, some of the incredible questions that you can ask, that we've been asking about these archives and showing with these documents is about African-American employees from Oxford and their work prior to 1950. And uh, even though I meant we have only about 75, I think 75 uh, stories in our story portal, uh, Dr. Shoemaker identified 240 African-American employees at Miami University um, before 1950. So there's a lot more to tell here. And we, here's one of the images from our archive that we digitized for this project. You can see Mamie Sewell and Ruby Knox here. Next slide, please. So another part was is learning a bit more about how Miami University provided opportunities and also those connections between the Oxford community and the university. And so here, Helen did a lot of great job. If she could be here to tell you this, I'm summarizing her research, but she's been exploring those, these educational benefits to African-American employees prior to 1950. So there are dozens of African-American students who are the children and grandchildren of Miami University employees. And you can see uh, a photo here of some of the employees. Uh, next slide, please. One of the documents that kind of uh, supports that uh, is featured here. It's a memo from 1938. And you learn that Miami University provided those school fees or what we know as tuition waivers for all employees, including African-American women. Um, working in the lunchroom. And these are some of the lowest paid employees on the campus, but they provided, my university provided one waiver per family. 
And these fees um, were of such a value that they often exceeded the parents' in, um, uh, income that year. Next slide, please. Another, another topic when we're kind of moving more closer to the day is the, these archives, these digitized documents and the stories we've been, the documentaries as well, tell about um, a lot of debates that were happening um, about race and about you know, Miami University's responsibilities. And you can see that in the administration debates and the struggles in the President, President Shriver's era. Uh, when Shriver, after 1970, promises to introduce more racial diversity in faculty, staff, and student populations. And um, you also learn more about, he didn't do, just do that from, from methane. He did that in response to student activism, specifically Black student activism. And here in this photo, during um, a strike protest, you can see Larry Clark, who was um, just an incredible leader on campus and um, alumni in 1970 um, together on stage. Uh, Larry Clark had just spoken, and so Schreiber was offering his remarks. So there's this really interesting dynamic between, between the groups um, and the administration that you can learn more about in Bittersweet and other documentaries and oral histories, but also in the archive itself. Next slide, please. And another important part is um, the development of those core programs that uh, related to diversity at Miami. Maybe you would be familiar, uh, maybe to folks, um, um, you know, uh, attending today. We have Bridges. Um, we also have some of the early uh, first attempts at faculty, Black faculty recruitment. And, you know, <laughs> what's real interesting, uh, we have the brochures and all that stuff, but it's really interesting to kind of dive into those documents to see, like, the links that early Miami went, um, 1970 went to, to include and be more inclusive. Um, and they tell their own stories about getting on buses to go to the go to HBCUs in the South and um, and also just laying the groundwork and the discussions um, to constantly advocate for these programs and their impact. So I hope that gives you a little bit of um, a glimpse into some of these documents that also thread their way through our oral histories as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, because, you know, this is just the beginning for us. It's a pilot project. Um, this is our first a crack at our archive, too. Um, and we're, we're constantly improving our ways to connect all these resources together. Um, so I would like to go ahead and pass it on to Dr. Eva Harris, who's going to discuss the advisory board and also our next step. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you today and also to be a part of this phenomenal project. Um, I do wanna let you know that the curator's statement as well as the videotaped interviews were actually reviewed by an advisory board. Is there a slide for that that I can mention the advisory board, please? So the advisory board, and these are faculty and staff from areas all across campus. Kurt Ellison and I served as co-chairs, Anne Elizabeth Armstrong from CCA, Denise Bazil from CEHS, Darrell Collier from CEHS, Lynn Ditch from CLASS, Annika Elias was our student, Dolores Rome Hudson was our alum. Uh, Andrew Offenberger represented CAS, Jody Perkins, the libraries, Sanjay Pugata, FSB, Kate Ruminaire, a CEHS, and Aliyah represented the libraries. Next slide, please. So what were our responsibilities? Well, we really wanted to do several things as we looked at the curator's statement, but especially as we looked at the uh, videotaped interviews. We wanted to provide thoughts on ways to improve the, the videos and reorganize video content. And keep in mind, we met throughout the fall semester, and I think a couple of times during this semester in advance of our uh, presentation and launch. We wanted to identify controversial content and missing content. We wanted to make sure that stories were accurate as much as possible. We wanted to make sure that the stories were fair to individuals and institutions and to Miami institutions. And we wanted to make sure that the language was appropriate for college age audiences as well as the public. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here with this project? Well, certainly the goal is student engagement with the archives and the interviews. There's several ways that we're envisioning this kind of rolling out. 
through a social inquiry course or Miami Senior Capstone course, something, for example, that might focus on power, justice, and social change, or something that might focus on creativity, storytelling, and design. We also envision something like a, a faculty-led two-semester course for graduate and undergraduate students with the goals of creating team-based projects using the archives and the interviews and concluding with public presentations of these projects. Next slide, please. And I think I'm punting this over to Jackie Johnson. Thank you. At this point, questions? Yes, yeah, so we do have um, some questions that came in. Um, so uh, first, first question is, uh, so how does funding help with research like this? Anybody want to take it? I'll take that. Well, it helps us to continue our work. Um, if it wasn't for the lived experiences funding that we received from Miami University, also the funding that we received from the Humanities Center and the funding from the Oxford Community Foundation, we would not be here. So the funding allows us to do our work. It allows us to um, purchase images and materials. It helps us to with, with to pay the, for student work and for student assistance. So without any funding, there is no project. Can I add too that one of the things that we'd like to be able to do is to provide uh, faculty and students with many grants uh, at some point to have access to the archives. And so they can use these mini grants in, in, sort of, in all sorts of cre creative ways. So funding is certainly um, important to allow that to happen. Um, so how do we, so the other question is, how do we go back to selecting the, the interviewees for, uh, for the, the oral histories? Um, so I think Andy, maybe you can start with that. Maybe I can add to that. Yeah. Um, so there were some very clear key people who had been in the institution for a long time. Uh, and we, we started with folks that we knew that had a long institutional history. Uh, we started with people who said yes. There are a lot, there were a number of people who didn't want to be interviewed for this project. They just weren't comfortable sharing the experiences that they'd had here. Um, and then it was to some extent a snowball sampling style. I guess you'd say we talked to people, they would suggest to other people, our kind of core team. Uh, and I gotta say, it was just, it's been wonderful to work with all these folks. I really love these guys uh, that are on this call here. And there's a few other people that would, would uh, contribute to these conversations too. But we just try to think about uh, the various individuals that had been at this institution uh, since the 1970s um, and see who, who was uh, accessible and uh, reachable for, for the interviews that we did over the summer. One other thing about the funding too, that allows us to pay students to work on a project like this. Uh, and that's just a win-win. I mean, it really shortens for a, a film like this, a complicated process it can take uh, 10 years to do something like this if you do it on your own. And when you have a few people helping out in a bunch of different ways, uh, you can do it in nine months. I mean, it's a, it was a really fast process to put this um, project together. Um, so having funding to pay students helps accelerate uh, the work and gives them a, 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 an educational experience that is pretty unique. Um, I mean, I think the students that work on this, both in the archives and on the film, got a lot out of the project. Um, so, but the, the uh, Seth, what else would you like to say about um, finding people? Yeah, so, um, you know, we also wanted to provide a, a student perspective. And so we were very um, strategic in making sure we included some of our Black uh, student organizations. So you saw a clip in the trailer there from our uh, Black Student Action Association, which is our oldest non-Greek founded organization founded by Black students. Uh, it's currently still here. Um, it also had the, a clip from a young lady named Gappy Purnell, who's the leader of the Black Leadership Coalition, which is a group of student Black leaders that come together to make sure that they do programming that make sure that they uh, get as much impact uh, collectively together. Um, and so we also went around that's different events, uh, the Black Hair Expo by the Black Women's Empowered, uh, the Pink Pageant, 
Pink Panther pageant by the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And so we try to, you know, all these type of things are current to kind of give a picture of what the Black students are doing currently right now. And again, um, we just want to include some important figures in Miami University's history, like Larry Young, uh, Bill Madison, uh, uh, who's a graduate here in the 60s, uh, came back and worked at business school for a long time. Um, Rosemary McCullough, uh, who was a pivotal figure um, in, the, in the in the 80s and 90s. So we want to include people who were important. Gerald Yearwood, um, another individual as well. Um, and so we make sure we kind of give a clear picture of that and also include the work that Kurt Ellison and others did on the previous pro similar project in 2000s of interviews they did with key uh, and various individuals across the university, you know, President Shriver and other uh, Black alumni, um, people affiliated with the university, Dr. Murders Powell, uh, to kind of give a, a complete foundation and picture from that from those oral histories to kind of help tell the story that we're trying to tell uh, in, the, in the interviews. And my, and my dad was interviewed <laughs> in the 2000s. So both my, myself and my dad are also <laughs> have our oral histories included in here. So, so it's all good. Um, so another question is, uh, how do we, how do we embark on going on to this journey about starting this project? And so how do we, how do we go about wanting to do this? Do you want Jackie or Jackie. Want to start Jackie, yeah, Jackie. Jackie. <laughs> Jackie? Well, how how do we embark on wanting to do this? Yes. Well, I don't want to make it too personal, but I think that with all the protests that happened a couple of years ago and all of the violence that we've had in the country and all the things dealing with African Americans and our relationships and just the things that happened, I just thought it was time for us to really embark on upon a new way to tell a story. And the Boldly Creative Fund gave us the opportunity to kind of focus on alumni and focus on Miami. You know, I'm an archivist, so I work for the university, I'm a university archivist. And so the connection was telling our history and so my first thought was to was to really focus on Miami's history and our connection to slavery. And so, but um, so we had some communications by that. And so we changed and tweaked the project. So then we decided to focus on a certain part of our, I guess, like decades, right? 70s to maybe the 2000s. And so that was good. But I really thought that what inspired me was really what happened with George Floyd just to be candid. And when I heard that there were so many students who were experiencing so many racial, let's see, problems at Miami, even in this time we're living in, I just thought it was time for us to really focus on something that would really tell the history. And hopefully this project was really meant to bring unity to the university community. So it's not to bring division, it was to bring us together to learn more about the lived experiences of African Americans who attended and worked at Miami University. Um, kind of more on that. Um, so we know there's uh, some similar projects that have been done at predominantly white institutions, PWI. Um, and so the question is, have, have we looked at those projects as the kind of help guide us in what we're doing? Have we kind of consulted with them? I don't know if, if our, our librarians on the here, I want to share about that and answer that question. Sure, I can. I could try first. There are there are some great projects out there, and we have uh, one of them we had our eye on is from the University of Maryland. It's um, they call it a reparative oral history project, Black experiences at the University of Maryland, and they, you know, so in some ways it was kind of one part of what we did. I think, uh, and so I, I definitely. You know, kept up with that project. Um, there's another one, uh, a, one a famous one that was published last year um, um, called Slavery, Abolition, Emancipation, and Freedom from Harvard um, by Dorothy Berry. She was a digital collections librarian at the time. And she did a, put together a phenomenal website of digitized primary sources about Black experience. Uh, these were that were in their special collections. The difference is these are, um, you know, it's Harvard's, so they have <laughs> incredible special collections. So she digitized materials um, about Black experience, you know, 
from going back to the 18th century. Um, and, um, but it wasn't necessarily specific to Harvard. So there are a lot of these projects that we looked at. And of course, you know, there are some great, amazing and inspirational ones from HBCUs. They have a celebrating the collections of a, the historically black um, colleges and universities uh, website where they bring together all the different uh, HBCU collections and what they digitize about their history too. So I think what we, what we found was that there, there's these great models of inspiration for certain parts of our project, but we didn't have a, a model for all what we ended up taking on, which is all the parts, the oral histories and the digitization and the documentaries. So that was kind of, that was new to us. So we definitely, um, and we only had a year to do this. So, and we did reach out a little bit, but most like I did mostly to kind of double check about themes or some some more technical issues. But I think that as we're going into the second phase, I think it would be great to expand and um, build out more collaborations, especially as we're seeing these connections uh, between the university and how porous they are with, for example, um, the South when it, with those ties to slavery um, and slaved money that was uh, funding, you know, feeding into the tuition here um, in the 19th century. And I think that there's, as well as, um, of course, the Great Migration. So I think there are some uh, opportunities to reach out, at, to say nothing of, of course, the Cincinnati area and um, as well as uh, Eastern uh, in, uh, Indiana. So that's a great question. Thank you, Leah. I don't know if you want to add anything else to that, Jackie, or? No, I think Leah answered it. Okay. So one of our recent Black graduates uh, from the class of 2022, a specific question about uh, what, is, what does it mean to be Black in America in 2023? And for them, um, like, what, is it like, what does it mean to be a Black woman in a white male-dominated world? Her, you know, her it's a business world. Um, but so I don't know if, if we, uh, how we want to answer that question first. Uh, I know, Dr. Harris, you want to share a little bit on that? take a stab at it. What does it mean to be black in America? Oh my yeah. God. That I was thinking about how would I answer that as an older black woman? What does it mean to be who's, who's came, who grew up on the tail end of the civil rights movement. So was really too young for lots of movements, but I think what it represents is, um, Oh my goodness. I, I don't want to use the word resiliency because I already trashed that word in one of our earlier talks, but I, it's the resolve, it's the commitment, it's the connection to the ancestors, it's the, the agency, be it self-agency or community agency, to, to move forward through the most diverse, I'm sorry, adverse experiences. And I know I'm babbling around the circle because that's a really hard question to answer, Selena. What does it mean to be Black in America in 2022? I think for me, it means that I always have a connection to my ancestral spirit because and those are the ones that have gone before me and actually provide me with a sense of grounding when the water gets consistently murky and hard. So that's what it means for me to be Black in America in 2020. And, and uh, I was add to that since you've graduated from Miami, some positive wins, if you've and done well here. So you've uh, been able to experience that world. So use your experiences at Miami uh, and when, in, your, in your field and find some mentors. I think you're referring to black women. So find some uh, black women who are very successful in your, fear, in your field to get mentorship to see how they've navigated that world uh, and, and be successful. Okay. So we had a question about the title, uh, Bittersweet. Um, it's mentioned a few times um, and it's kind of a theme. Um, so I kind of alluded to it earlier. I don't know Andy um, and then I kind of went back and forth on this. You want to talk a little bit more about the bittersweet word uh, yeah. that we use for the, the documentary? Yeah. Uh, there were two key people who passed away before we had a chance to talk to them. Um, and those, when you're making a film like this, they, they haunt you to some extent. One was Larry Young, uh, who uh, was retired in Arizona. Uh, we had an interview with him that Kurt Ellison had done in 2008, uh, where he offered this very hard-won 
deep reflection on what it meant to be in this place as a student, as a graduate student, and as an, an administrator. Um, just the kind of internal conflicts that he felt, uh, both because he had deep friendships with people here, he had good working relationships with a lot of colleagues, and he dealt with a lot of difficult things and some stuff I don't think he said on, on camera. Um, and he used that word uh, in the interview. He talked about, he said, I think many uh, African Americans would identify with this, that uh, being at Miami is a bittersweet experience. Uh, and that there are some people uh, who can't get over the really tough things that happen. They dwell on it. It's hard. And other people can kind of put that in the past and maybe repress it a bit, push it down in a way so that they can think about the sweet things, the nice things that happen to them here. Um, early on in the film, when we were we were thinking we would develop shorts that could be used in teaching settings. And to some extent, we've done that. But they're, they're, they're linked together in this longer story now. So it's flexible in the way that it can be used. Um, that, was the, that was the title early on. Uh, and when we did an interview with Antonia White, uh, who I think graduated in 2008. Um, so this was, you know, 40 years later. He used the same word to describe his experience here. Uh, he, and he actually ended up writing a, a master's thesis on the early history of the Black Student Action Association and other activism on campus here, uh, using some of the archival materials that were recently um, uh, published. And so, uh, you know, we, when we, we saw that, the same word being used across 40 years of time, uh, it seemed like it was an important one. And we kind of ground truth did a little bit with folks that were here. Uh, and when we'd interview them, we'd tell, ask what they thought about the title. Um, in general, it seemed to stick. Uh, so we, we went with it, um, kind of from there, Seth, I don't know if there's anything more you want to add. Yeah. Um, you know, working for the Miami diversity alumni association, you know, kind of a rosy colored eyes on the experiences, but uh, we couldn't ignore those some painful experiences as well. So it's kind of all in between, um, folks had great experiences, you know, relationships with professors, you know, joining you know, uh, organizations um, or national panhellenic chapters here, for example, or gospel choir or BSAA or whatever. So um, those friendships last for a long time. I know my parents and their, some of their um, peers from that era still talk today after 40 years after graduating. So those were some positives and staying abroad. You know, my parents really loved that experience. But there's some uh, painful experiences that Black folks have here. And uh, we couldn't ignore that in this project. Um, and we kind of alluded that to the the broader spectrum of the experiences of Black folks at in, in America. Um, so you can't talk about our experiences without sharing the the negative stuff uh, throughout the history. And so we tried to we looked at this at that term to kind of encapsulate all of that. Um, another question. Um, so is there any way for uh, for us uh, being uh, forced to get involved with this project as new Miami graduates? Yes. <laughs> so we will um, you know, have information be sent for folks to be able to watch and look at it. Just share it in your networks on social media and word of mouth and by email. Um, you know, we'll, you know, we have a whole database of thousands of people that we send out information to. And so make sure uh, you uh, look out for it and share it within your networks um, and your chapter, your chapter organizations that we have across the country. Because um, we want to make sure that this history is known. Um, I think because of what has been missing is that there's, you know, people don't know too much about our story. We kind of live in our siloed worlds here. Um, unfortunately here in Miami, uh, that we don't know what other folks are going through. And so it's important to at least learn the history and be able to uh, share that information so we can get the whole picture of experiences of all types of folks here at Miami But for this project for Black folks. I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. I'll say one quick thing, but I don't want to occupy too much time with it. When something like this is released, there's a buzz about it for a while. We're a little bit in that window now. 
next six months to a year, maybe. I don't know who knows how long that kind of lasts. Um, and we don't quite know. I mean, it's so there's a, an opportunity to have a broader conversation um, to think about policies that we could improve. I, th I mean, I think there really is a space for that kind of um, dialogue um, in the in the very near future. So, you know, we're probably going to need to think about that. Like, what what do we want that conversation to be? and to do moving forward uh, to help the experiences of black students who are currently here, uh, to have better ways of uh, establishing relationships with uh, kids so, that, so they can have a pipeline coming in here, knowing what they're getting into with career pathways coming out that lead them to their chosen professions. Um, and having alumni that are supportive is really, really helpful with some of those bigger picture things. Um, so that, I think that's probably a, a conversation down the road. We haven't really talked about that internally. It's been a race to the finish line just to get all of the materials out uh, in this kind of way. I, you know, another when you get money to do this kind of project, you want to do it well uh, because you want the next round to be embraced and not fought. Um, so we 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 were um, it was a, a labor of love in many ways. Um, not a labor of wages. And um, it's, uh, uh, and so we, we want it to do some good. Um, it's another question um, for Black alum. They want to know, if, will there be additional opportunities for folks to still be interviewed? Um, yes. <laughs> Who's asking that question? <laughs> uh, my mama, my mom, who's a, that's yes, funny. definitely. She's definitely gonna kill me for saying uh, <laughs> Carolyn Doolin Seward, class of two, of 1981, asked the question. Um, so yes, yeah, so there'll be opportunities to interview folks. Uh, unfortunately, we were able to capitalize everything into the documentary or to the interviews, and so I think there's um, other information that folks can learn about from from uh, different sources of people. So we definitely um, we're definitely welcome. Uh, folks to, uh, if they want to be interviewed for the project to communicate to us. I don't know, Andy, you want to add more to that? Carolyn, thank you. <laughs> Your son's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so it's there, and just a general question. So how do we want to see what this project does going forward? Is there any other general thoughts on that and what you hope that a lasting impact that this will have for the university? Are you asking us, Seth? Yes, yes. I really would like to see faculty student engagement. You know, I think we're working on that um, in terms of incentivizing faculty student engagement with, with the archives and with the interviews. And so I think therein lies the power of continuity, right? Therein lies the power of creativity you know, and therein lies the power of legacy. So that that would be my my dream. And also what Andy just said too, how do we take this information and craft policy out of it? And, and you're right, we've not discussed it, but now that you said it, we are gonna discuss it. I can say from, you know, website side is that we designed the website to be scalable, um, to continue to grow. And, you know, in our pilot project, we just we focused a lot on black experience. And we want to continue that and add new stories and our website's designed for growth and we want to grow. Uh, the other thing with, that's really important, too, is it's also designed to um, explore other races and ethnicities and bring those stories uh, together. So um, I'd love to see um, us do um, sort of heart history kind of connections with uh, Latinx and Latino, Latina pop uh, groups, as well as uh, more Asian American, more Asian groups that come through. Um, we have a lot that we have history for, um, for those communities that go, that go way back into the early, into the 1910s and 20s. And so there's a lot there. And of course we wanna hear the contemporary voices and experiences as well. And so we have a, um, a website, we have kind of a model um, that's, that's designed to be inclusive and to to add more stories and kind of that way we can kind of see those commonalities and solidarities um, across the decades. And I would add to that also the kind of a legacy, also to help spread the awareness of the excellence that comes out of the black alumni that come out of this institution. We have 
6,815 uh, known living Black alumni from uh, around the United States and across the world who've been successful in a variety of fields. And just one tidbit on that, we've got that nine got nine judges, uh, two who were just appointed by President Biden who have been confirmed by the U.S. Senate, and one um, specifically, uh, Judge Dana Douglas, who made history and be the first Black woman to be uh, on the um, federal court for the, uh, for the fifth district of court of appeals uh down there that uh, that covers mississippi louisiana and texas i believe um and so it's just a small spectrum of the success that black alumni have had over the years even through the experiences at miami um so kind of just this project itself you know, lose that legacy of uh of success and excellence of black alumni um going back to another Craig walker who graduated in 1905. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay. All right. So we uh, we thank all of our everybody here that uh, has shared with us um, today. Thank you for your contributions on this project, and thank you for sharing um, about what roles that you had here. Um, we ask folks to continue to watch our programming here uh, through the uh, North University Alumni Association. We always have uh, a lot of uh, exciting webinars that are coming up uh, for this we will send out a, a thank you email with, with some links for folks to access more about the project so you can go through all the research and interviews and things of that nature so you can uh, share that with your networks and with that said love and honor and thank you for watching